So thanks, Simeon, and thank you all for coming. It's really a pleasure to escape New York City and come to Riverside. It's my first time here. It's absolutely lovely. Um, and today, I'm really excited to tell you uh, a little bit about the work that myself, my collaborators, and my students have been working on in terms of solving a problem that's maybe even harder than turbulence in magnetic fields, but very much related, which is the problem of star formation. Um, and I say it's maybe even harder because it ties in a lot of interesting physics, both turbulence, so that's why it's called turbulent beginnings, um, but also the effects of gravity, magnetic fields, and then once the stars are formed, how they back react on the gas that they're forming out of via processes known as stellar feedback, which is just a catch-all phrase for all kinds of things. Um, so the movie you're watching over and over again that's looping is actually a, a numerical simulation that myself and my collaborators uh, have been performing simulations like this where we start with initial turbulent conditions that we think uh, molecular clouds in our galaxy, in our Milky Way galaxy, and also other nearby galaxies are, are, are forming, and stars form out of these very turbulent, um, very chaotic systems. Um, and the initial condition here is that you have turbulence at the start, and then the, the high-density regions become gravitationally unstable and start collapsing. So this is the basic picture I want you to keep in mind. But I kind of understand that maybe not all of you are familiar with what I mean when I say turbulence, right? Because that ends up being a catch-all phrase for actually many different processes. So I want to talk a little bit about that at the start. And in particular, I'd like to point out that turbulence and this turbulent motion of fluids, in particular the fact that these uh, space fluids are magnetized. This magnetization gives rise to very interesting fluid properties which are called MHD or magnetohydrodynamic properties of fluids, which we don't often encounter here in terms of terrestrial fluids, like for example the air in this room, right? So this would be a hydrodynamic type of, of fluid. Um, or, for example, clouds in the sky, those are also very turbulent. They're not magnetized, though, right? So we have to go to space often. Uh, you know, the closest example probably is the solar wind or the Earth's magnetosphere. So it gives rise to these very interesting properties, um, such as magnetic re reconnection, right? So we see um, the aurora borealis is, is a, a direct uh, result of the solar wind impinging on the Earth's magnetic field and interacting in the upper atmosphere. Um, there's also interesting effects related to magnetic fields and turbulence that connect to the solar dynamo, so the generation of magnetic fields uh, in the sun or in stars. Um, so you basically cannot ignore turbulence in magnetic fields if you want to try to explain this physical phenomenon. And I've listed a couple of interesting problems that I like to think about and, and my group works on related to MHD turbulence here. Probably the one that is most strikingly on everyone's mind is related to black hole accretion disks, right? So the, with the big announcement of the um, black hole image yesterday of M87, everyone is talking about this on social media. Like probably some of you right now are on your computers tweeting about it right now. Um, so you know, I, I'll mention this a little bit later in my talk. The accretion disk around compact objects and black holes is thought to be highly turbulent. And so why did we see M87 yesterday? It's, it's in part because M87 is not so time variable in terms of the properties of the accretion disk. It's more smoothly varying, whereas the next most likely target, which is the, the supermassive black hole at the center of our Milky Way, Sagittarius A star, that accretion disk is certainly more turbulent, right? And so the, the Event Horizon Telescope team showed us M87 in part because this is a problem, right? This turbulence problem. Um, so this is just to highlight all the amazing, interesting problems uh, that maybe students might get excited about with M which, which turbulence. I don't have, of course, time to talk about all of these areas of research. Um, but this is essentially a summary of my talk. So I want to back up a little bit and talk about what is turbulence. Uh, what do I mean by it? And as Simeon pointed out, it's a very hard problem. It's, it's actually the problem of, of just even terrestrial hydrodynamic turbulence is a classical unsolved problem in mathematics and physics. So how can we as physicists, as astrophysicists, study it? I want to briefly touch on that. And then in part two, I want to kind of zoom in on one of these particular areas of astrophysical interest that touches on turbulence. And in particular, I'll talk about star formation and how turbulence 
can regulate star formation. And I ultimately want to address one aspect here, which is the star formation efficiency and how it's a combination of this fluid turbulence coupled with gravity and, and the feedback from stars that allows us to explain observations of the star formation efficiency. Um, and I'll just even throw up the summary points for that. So this would be the predictions and features of that model. Um, I will definitely get back to this. I won't read it all out right now, but that you'll see it again. And in this talk, you'll notice that there's constantly this interplay between the numerical simulations, like I showed you on my title slide, with observations and analytic theory. And so this is really ultimately how I think about this communication of, of these different components of theory, talking to observation, talking to numerical uh, numericists. I think this is ultimately what we have to do in order to make any sort of progress on any physical phenomena that uh, magnetic fields and turbulence touch on uh, in, in astrophysical um, situations. Uh, because again, it's an unsolved problem. Okay, so first I want to touch on what is turbulence. And I think this is important. If anyone ever starts talking about turbulence in a talk, you should say, hey, what do you mean by turbulence? Do you mean just random motions? Do you mean chaos? Do you mean something that has statistical properties? And actually, this is, this is a funny point, because I was at a conference not too long ago which brought together experts on turbulence from the point of view of astrophysics and physics, mathematics, and engineering. So we had this really great conference. Um, we're actually going to have another one uh, in, in a few months in New York, so if it sounds interesting. Uh, feel free to ask me about it. And the very final conference discussion with all these experts in the room from all these different disciplines was, what is turbulence? And we argued and had a discussion for two hours about the definition of turbulence. So this is not a non-trivial thing. So this is my definition. So first of all, it's not just chaos, right? When you think of turbulence, you often think of these random chaotic motions in a fluid, these eddies. Um, it's not just chaos. So, so yes, it looks partic particularly chaotic, but if you were to take a snapshot of a turbulent flow and analyze it in a statistical way, right? So analyze its spatial properties, its temporal properties, um, you would start to find actually there's some very nice regularity, some beautiful mathematical regularities with the turbulent flow. So one very common way or a common statistic that people in the turbulence community uh, discuss and would like to measure is something called the Fourier power spectrum, okay? So the Fourier power spectrum, you can either define it temporally or spatially. Here it's a spatial power spectrum. This K is the wave number, which is inverse of spatial scale. And you have amplitude or power of some quantity. So it could be, for example, the kinetic energy. Right? So this would be kinetic energy amplitude as a function of essentially spatial scale on this axis. So this is a cartoon. So why is this a nice statistic of a turbulent cascade? It's because this, the turbulence behaves a, uh, displays a very nice statistical property when you look at this Fourier power spectrum. In particular, at large scales, you have an injection of energy, right? So you have some plume or jet, or um, you stir you know, your coffee, uh, you stir the, the sugar in your coffee, you inject some sort of kinetic energy, and then this kinetic energy in a turbulent cascade moves down to smaller and smaller scales in this self-similar fashion until the energy then dissipates on a smaller scale. So this brings in the concept of turbulence as not just this randomness, but actually as this uh, physical process which moves energy from one scale to another in a fluid. This is what people mean when they say a turbulent cascade. They're talking about a cascade of energy. So most of the time, the energy moves from the largest scales in the system to the smallest scales, and these small scales are often de defined by the, the viscosity or the heat of the system. Um, it could also be a flow of entropy, yes. Uh, it depends, again, on the type of, of system involved. Um, and the statistical uh, predictiveness of this side, sort of picture is really powerful because of this self-similar nature, right? So you often find power laws in a, in a fully developed turbulent flow. And uh, if you read textbooks on turbulence, they'll often uh, spend a lot of time discussing the slope of this uh, 
self-similar power law range, which is called the inertial range. Um, so for example, there's a very famous um, paper by Komogorov in 1941, which describes a scaling for um, a hydrodynamical incompressible fluid. So this is one definition of turbulence, right? So if you talk to an engineer, they'll probably define turbulence in terms of something called the Reynolds number, right? Which is a ratio of the inertial uh, to viscous uh, force terms in terms of your Navier-Stokes equation. Um, you can also talk to a poet, right? So this is actually a little poem by uh, Lou Fry Richardson. He was also a physicist, not just a poet. Uh, and he describes uh, turbulence in a poem. Big worlds have little worlds that feed on their velocity, and little worlds have lesser worlds, and so on to viscosity. So this, I think, is a nice poetic example of this turbulent cascade. So to be a little more quantitative, um, you know, ultimately, I think a big progress in, in terms of just the general uh, uh, study of turbulence um, from the point of view of physicists or engineers or mathematicians has been with numerical simulations. Um, and so with these simulations, we take fluid equations, either the Navier-Stokes equations, um, which describe uh, mass conservation, energy conservation, momentum conservation for a fluid, so very simple, or the MHD equations, right, so the magnetohydrodynamic equations where we tie in Maxwell's equations to the fluid equations, and then we simulate them on a computer. And you could actually, in a very nice and, and elegant way, reduce a lot of the complexity of these turbulent box simulations. So for example, the one I showed you on my title slide, or this one I'm showing you here, this movie that'll loop several times, with some basic uh, dimensionalless parameters, right? So of course, the, the cascade, which I just described, is an important parameter. How much energy do you inject in the simulation? Right? How, how much do you force the momentum equation? Um, what scale do you force it on right, in this box? Do you force it on the largest scales, or do you choose some smaller region to force on? Um, the other two, which is not, this is not a dimensionless parameter, but there's two dimensionless parameters, which I'll, I'll mention later in the talk. Um, in particular, one that you're probably familiar with, which is the sonic Mach number. The sonic Mach number is the ratio of the turbulent kinetic energy to the thermal energy, or, the, or you can think of it just as the ratio of the turbulent velocity to the sound speed of the gas. Um, you're probably familiar with the Mach number because shocks are cool, like everyone likes supersonic airplanes. I like, hopefully will get a Concorde again and be able to fly from New York to London in like two hours. Um, right, so the problem with the Concorde is it creates a sonic boom, which no one wants to live near. So shocks are indeed something that we see in, in astrophysical environments and galaxies. In particular, they're very relevant for star formation, which I'll talk about in a little bit. And this simulation here that you're watching over and over again um, is a supersonic turbulent flow with a Mach number of 7. And so what you're seeing here is density features, right? So the yellow here are low density, the purple and red are the higher density contrasts, and as this fluid is moving, shocks are moving around it, creating these high density regions. Um, the other parameter, dimensionless parameter, again, uh, a ratio of two energy terms is the kinetic energy to the uh, magnetic energy. This can be parameterized as something called the alphenic Mach number which is, again, you can also think of it in terms of velocity terms, the ratio of the turbulent velocity to the so-called alphane speed. The alphane speed depends on the strength of the magnetic field and on the density. So the alphanic Mach number, you can think of it as characterizing the importance of the magnetic field on the fluid. So if you have what's called a subalphenic uh, fluid, the magnetic field is very strong. It's dynamically important for the fluid. If you have a superalphenic flow, uh, basically the turbulence wins and it pushes around the magnetic field. Um, and you get very different fluid properties in, in these sorts of simulations. Um, so there's many, you know, the great thing here is that there's many groups that are performing MHD turbulent simulations like this one. Um, and I think you know, this is just one from my group, but I think it's fantastic uh, for the community that there's so many different groups performing these simulations because, in fact, the parameter space can get quite complex. It can certainly get much more complex than just this. So, for example, if we want to study star formation, 
Um, we need to think about another parameter, again, dimensionalist, which is nice for our physical intuition, which is something called the virial parameter, which now that we turn on gravity for star formation, right, because we want to bring the, together material to form stars, the virial parameter is the ratio of the turbulent kinetic energy to the gravitational potential energy, right? So it characterizes the strength of gravity relative to the strength of turbulence in the fluid. So these kind of simulations, they're simple. They give some nice uh, parameters for our physical intuition. And we can actually use them to study, again, a lot of interesting problems in astrophysics. I, I showed you that cartoon at the start with some of these interesting uh, different areas. And a little just total shameless advertisement. I've started a simulation sharing project called the Catalog for Astrophysical Turbulence Simulations, or CATS. You can go to the website right now if you have your computer open, mhdturbulence.com. And you cannot imagine how excited I was when I got that domain name. I was just like, yes. Um, so excited. So this, this um, you know, even if you're not interested in turbulence or turbulence um, simulations, um, there's also interesting statistics uh, and tools and visualizations, which I'll, I'll discuss maybe why you might care about that in a moment. Um, and just to note that there's, this is a, sh a sharing project with, with different groups involved, different codes are involved. Um, so if you're interested, please, please feel free to get in touch with me. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, so, so certainly plasma theory. These are very similar or identical equations that they're solving, we're solving. Um, there are some different types of approaches. So this would be like a fully fluid approximation versus um, sometimes plasma, in particular, they're interested in direct particle interactions. So there are differences in terms of numerical method, but yes, these are very relevant for the plasma community as well. Um, okay. Um, so in the galaxy, they can, they can easily, I mean, you can have correlation links of the magnetic field lines that can be hundreds of parsecs long. And that's measured from various observations. In these simulations, actually, these simulations are scale-free simulations. Um, we don't have to set a particular scale until we, say, add in something like gravity, which requires us setting a particular length scale for the box. The magnitude... Oh, well, that's a parameter we can play with, right? And it would depend on what kind of system you want to. Yeah, um, Microgauss in terms of star forming regions. Yeah, so they're like more like microgauss type fields. Um, up, to, up to milligauss. So it depends on where you are and how dense the cloud is. Um, OK, so the final point I want to make about studying turbulence, right? So we have these simulations which give us some physical intuition. We also have analytic predictions. So for example, things like the Kolmogorov scaling would be one example of an analytic prediction. But to really facilitate a crosstalk between all of these different areas, we need some metric to compare them with, right? And so this is where statistics comes in. Um, so I mentioned the power spectrum. Um, but you know, statistics allow for all these different pieces to be connected. So between theory and observations, for example, theories like the Kolmogorov scaling for the inertial range, how can we test that? Well, we could apply the power spectrum to some observations, right? Either terrestrial turbulence or astrophysical turbulence and see if, if those scaling laws match. Um, we can test the quality of our numerical simulations, right? Did we properly resolve the turbulence, right? Did we resolve this inertial range? Um, so that, that would be an important aspect there for, for connecting theory and numerics. And then finally, this is something that's, that's pretty hot in uh, astrophysics right now, which is connecting observations and numerical simulations. How do you know you're not just comparing apples and oranges? How do you know your numerical simulation included all the physics that it needed to include, all the relevant pieces of, of physics? Um, and so people can compare these statistically, especially when you take the output of the numerical simulations and make what's called synthetic observations. So you, you say, OK, I'm going to. Uh, pretend like I observed this numerical simulation with a telescope with a particular beam size, with a particular sort of, of noise um, mask, 
um, and, and also perform some sort of radiative transfer. Okay, so what are these statistics? This could be a whole nother talk in itself. Um, this was essentially my, my PhD thesis, was working on developing higher order statistics beyond this traditional power spectrum view of turbulence in order to find these sort of interesting turbulence parameters or properties of the cascade um, and, and how also to uh, apply them to observations. So underlined here are different types of astrophysical observations. So you don't really need to know what all those, those mean, column density or synchrotron. Um, but suffice to say that there's statistical techniques that you could apply to a data set and then find out some interesting piece of physics. So the Mach numbers uh, are listed here. And again, a lot of these codes, uh, mostly in Python, are linked at mhdturbulence.com. So you could find a lot of these codes. And you know, just an uh, interesting point to say, like maybe you're like, well, I don't really care about turbulence. I don't need any of these statistics for turbulence because I don't work on turbulence. But it's actually interesting to keep in mind that a lot of these statistics were developed either from the mathematics community or actually in many cases here, uh, we took them from, from work from cosmology. So things like the bispectrum, which is essentially uh, a higher order version of the, the power spectrum, um, which, which preserves phase information, whereas the power spectrum, because it only preserves the amplitudes, it throws out the phase information. That was taken from cosmology. And it, just an interesting point from yesterday, the uh, Event Horizon Telescope um, collaboration published several papers um, where they were looking at their, new, their you know, mini uh, uh, GR uh, MHD simulations of the accretion flow around the black hole convolved with what the Event Horizon Telescope might see. Um, a big problem, as I mentioned, with Sagittarius A star is the fact that the disk might be highly turbulent, highly time variable, and that could obscure the shadow of the black hole. So there was a paper um, in 2015 where they were applying one of our techniques for radio synchrotron gradients as an edge detector, right, to find out edges, uh, which would then reveal in a more concrete way the shadow of the black hole. So, Statistics have a wide range of applications. Um, this is just kind of an example that came up from yesterday. Um, and I, I encourage you to check out uh, the website and see if maybe some of those statistics could be interesting for, for your research area. OK, so now I'd like to go into the part two of my talk. So I was talking very generally about turbulence, what it is. Now I'd like to kind of zoom in on one of these pieces here uh, and in particular, talk about the problem of star formation and how turbulence is related to that problem and how we can do, uh, make some progress there. And of course, star formation, it's this enormous field. It's this enormous topic. And people throw around um, star formation in all kinds of different contexts in different ways. And essentially, it's an unsolved problem in astrophysics. We still, we know quite a bit about what happens when the star is formed. Right? So for example, this stellar life cycle, which is essentially dictated entirely by the mass of the star that's formed, how it will ultimately die, either as a supernova, if it's a, a, a star with about eight solar masses or more, or if it's a star like our sun, it will you know, eventually become a red giant and then possibly a white dwarf. So we understand that physics very well. Right? We understand stellar uh, evolution very well. Um, we're starting to understand more and more about planet formation, right? So how, how planets are forming around stars. Um, but we still don't have a comprehensive theory of how we go from uh, gas that we see in galaxies, in our own galaxy, to, to a star. Um, there's a lot of interesting observations that are related to star formation. And in particular, there's really beautiful scaling laws, which you know, just beg theorists to try to understand them. And one of them is the issue of the star formation efficiency. And I'll define exactly what I mean by star formation efficiency. And this, by the way, is the only aspect of star formation I am going to talk about for the rest of the talk, is this thing called the star formation efficiency. So when people talk about star formation, they can talk about the star formation rate, and they can talk about the distribution of masses of stars, which is called the initial mass function. Um, 
and, and how this relates to galaxy evolution and all this stuff. But I'm only going to talk about this one aspect. Um, so, so what is the star formation efficiency and what, what does it have to do with galaxy evolution? This, I think, is a really um, incredible plot that basically summarizes what, what this means. So let me walk you through it. So the, the y-axis here is something called the star formation rate surface density. Um, so this is the rate of stars in terms of solar masses per mega year uh, divided by an area. So in this case, it's, it's parsec squared. On the x-axis here, you have the gas surface density divided by a time scale. In this case, it's the time scale, which is the, the free fall time of the gas. Right? So the free fall time is just essentially how fast will a cloud of some density, right, some density collapse. It turns out that time scale only depends on the density and fundamental constants. So that's only, all you need is the density to measure that. So this line here and all these points are, um, measurements, so the, I'll talk about the points first, the points here are measurements over, as you can see, many orders of magnitude in star formation rate and gas density, surface density divided by this free fall time. The collection of colored points here are local star forming clouds in our Milky Way. And then you go up in terms of star formation rate and gas surface density all the way up to these high redshift systems. So these are actually now individual points here are galaxies at uh, local galaxies or galaxies that are uh, many mega light years away or mega parsecs away. You see that they pretty much follow on this, this line, right? So this is the incredible thing I want you to notice. And this line here, what it means is that you have a conversion of gas, gas density to star formation density of about 1%. The gas is efficient at turning into stars uh, at about a 1% rate. That's what I mean by the star formation efficiency. And the incredible thing here is that it doesn't seem to depend on if you're locally in the Milky Way versus if you're in some high redshift galaxy far, far away. You know, and of course there is some scatter, and I will address that here, but this is the amazing thing about this plot is that basically gas turns into stars in galaxies at about a 1% efficiency. Now, I want to pause, and again, I said I would really carefully define the efficiency. Um, if you go into the astrophysical literature and you start, you know, after my talk, you're like, wow, star formation efficiency, that's so cool. I want to read more. And you'll go into the literature and you'll, you'll see many definitions of star formation efficiency, particularly if you look at the observer papers. Um, so as I said, there's many definitions. One definition that I'll be focused on is something called the star formation efficiency per free fall time, right? So the efficiency uh, per individual gas free fall time. Basically, you can just think of this as, well, I have some cloud of gas with some mass. It has some characteristic size, which sets a characteristic density. So that gives it a free fall time, right? So what would be, and then I measure some actual star formation rate in that cloud, right? So that's this m dot star here. Uh, the efficiency, then, is the comparison of the actual star formation rate to the idealized rate if all the gas collapsed on its free fall time. Okay, that's the star formation efficiency per free fall time. And I've written it here in words. There's another one called the integrated star formation efficiency, which is the mass of stars that you form in a cloud or have formed at a particular time divided by the total cloud mass. Right, so if you have some cloud how good is it at forming stars, right? How many stars did you form out of how much mass did you start at? Okay, that's another definition. Then, just, just if you go into the literature, there's another definition, which I won't talk about at all because I'm not going to be going through this. But basically, it's an efficiency that is only characterized by what's called a depletion time. How long did it take you to turn that gas into stars? Right? That's what a depletion time is. And just as a warning, uh, you'll often see essentially this as being measured um, in, in observers' papers. Observers out there, sorry, I don't want to upset you, but just, just to warn everyone. I'm going to be working with this definition. 
So now that definitions are over, how does this star formation picture look like in terms of our current understanding? And, and I think this theory you know, of, of what's called turbulent regulated star formation, or, or I, as I will call it, gravo-turbulent regulated star formation, and you'll hopefully see why in a minute, makes a lot of sense. And, and here I've sort of made a pictorial version of that. You know, you have this picture of turbulence that I described, right? So you can either think of this as, you know, stirring your coffee, right, in your coffee cup and mixing your milk, right? So you'd have a driving scale of roughly the size of your cup. Or you can think of this as a galaxy which has large-scale energetic processes like supernova or like gravitational instabilities or torques in a disk. Those also are, in some sense, the largest scale drivers um, in our universe, right? So that's the stirring of the coffee cup here. So this large scale driving induces turbulence. So you have this cascade that goes to smaller and smaller scales. And if this cascade is supersonic, you induce density fluctuations. So those density fluctuations, if they're strong enough, right, you collect enough material, it starts to collapse under its own self-gravity, and then it forms stars. Okay, and then the stars then, because they're stars, they have winds, they have jets, they become potentially supernova at the end of their life. All of that is called feedback. It's sort of under this big umbrella. The feedback, of course, because it's an energetic process, injecting kinetic energy can then drive turbulence again. That's the basic cartoon picture of this gravo-turbulent regulated star formation. And this, effi this efficiency that I talked about, this, or this inefficiency, you could say, is a consequence of the fact that turbulence, um, in addition to other processes like magnetic fields and, and thermal support, sets a threshold for the collapse to happen. You need, you need to, gravity needs to overcome all of these pressure support terms, right, in order to collapse. And that's where these density fluctuations come in. You need to have enough material that it becomes uh, gravitationally unstable. So another way to think about that is there's some critical density over, uh, of which you have to be in order to start collapsing based on how turbulent or how magnetized or how warm your gas is. Okay, so again, a dimensionalist parameter like the virial parameter comes into play um, and you can there's a number of, of arguments you can make for setting a critical density, which depends on the properties of turbulence, thermal pressure, and, and magnetic pressure as well. Um, the other thing is that once you reach this critical density, you have gravity, collapse happens rapidly, and then you get an accelerated star formation rate. And then, of course, you have this, this feedback processes that inject material, or inject um, kinetic energy, uh, and overall reduce the star formation efficiency. So this is this basic picture, right? So you have inefficiency, this 1%. Where does it come from? The cartoon picture is that you have turbulence and some other support terms which prevent collapse. And then at the end of the day, you also have feedback processes from the stars which throw the gas out. Okay, that's a cartoon. What about an analytic model that encompasses all those things? Do we have such a model? Um, I would say that we have certainly uh, come a long way to incorporating all the physics uh, of that picture into a model, and that's essentially what I want to tell you about now. And the situation up until about a year ago was a picture which really only included turbulence. Okay, so I've listed a few references here if you're interested, and these particular aspect of, of turbulent regulated star formation actually has been used not only to describe the inefficiency of star formation, but also other aspects of star formation, like you know, the distribution of masses that are formed, which is called the initial mass function, the star formation rate, and the plot I showed you at the start, which is essentially called the kennicott schmidt relation. OK, so what is this model of turbulent regulated star formation? It's actually very simple. It's essentially the only idea here is that you have a turbulent distribution which sets density fluctuations, right? Some of those density fluctuations will be high enough because of the shocks to push you over that critical density, okay? And then you form stars. So then all you need to know is, well, what is the density distribution that is set by a supersonic turbulent fluid, 
And then a lot of people will give you the same answer. It's based either you can make analytic arguments, um, or you can run a turbulent simulation and just compute the, the density distribution. Turns out it's a nice log normal. And here's a cartoon of that here how, in how these star formation pictures work. So you have essentially a histogram or a probability distribution function of the density field. So on the x-axis here, you see density or, or log density as it, as it should be. Uh, and then you have the, the number, right? So if this is normalized, you integrate this to one. Um, and, you, and you form a nice, what's called a log normal uh, distribution from a turbulent flow. And you have some critical density, right? So you need to say, well, how much material, this is the critical density here, how much material in my log normal is past that critical density? And you can do an integral over this log normal. And because it's a log normal, it's so easy to do analytically, right? You can integrate this past the critical density. And then if you want the, the efficiency per free fall, well, you can say, well, my normalized uh, free fall time or my normalized time scale will, will just be the free fall past either the mean density or maybe from the critical density. And you multiply this log normal distribution uh, by, by the density, you get the total amount of material uh, which is available for star formation. Okay, and did I put the, well, I'll show you the analytic expression. It's just, it's an error function, right? It's just an integral over a log normal. And that's it, you're done. Like, go home. You're, you're finished. Well, not quite, right? And so, again, this picture only includes turbulence. And so that's, that's going to be the key point for the rest of the talk. Um, and I want to make a few more points about this log normal uh, predictions, right? So wh what, what does this predict in terms of the star formation efficiency? Um, right? So a log normal is, is a really simple function because the only real controlling parameter here is the width. Right, what is the width of the log normal? And if your critical density is, is you know, whatever it is, roughly constant, well, the width is going to be very important, right? Because the wider the log normal, the more material, the more matter you'll push past that critical density, the higher your star formation rate or star formation efficiency. So what sets the width? Well, it turns out there's a lot of uh, careful studies on this, both numerical and, and also analytic. Um, I think this is a really nice simulation. Um, by uh, Daniel Price and Christoph Federas, where they run one of these turbulent box simulations that I showed you um, earlier in the talk. And so they initialize the turbulence, starts from this uh, uniform density, they start driving kinetic energy, and then this is the corresponding density PDF, right? So this is the density field. This is its corresponding probability distribution function. And at the end of their simulation, you see this nice log normal that forms, okay? Um, and what sets the width of the log normal? Well, it turns out it's proportional to the Mach number. So how strong your shocks are, right? And this, I think, makes intuitive sense. If you have stronger shocks, stronger density contrasts, stronger density fluctuations, you drive this width to both higher and lower density values, I mean, if you, if you conserve mass in this system. And I can just show you that pictorially. So this, again, is the width of the, the log normal related to the properties of turbulence. Here is one of my turbulent boxes with a Mach number of, of 0.5. Um, just showing you the picture because it's very pretty, I think. Um, here's its corresponding PDF, right? So imagine you had some critical density, right, here. Let's say it's just arbitrarily here. Well, in this picture, this, this subsonic picture, you didn't produce a lot of density fluctuations. Right, because you don't have any shock. So you have a very narrow distribution of density. And you didn't push enough density past this critical density, so you didn't form any stars. Okay. So now what if I run a new simulation, and now I have a Mach number of 2. Uh, and that's, of course, I just choose that. I, I run the simulation, I choose that. And now you see, oh, you get these nice filaments, these, these shocked material, and your distribution here is now much wider. Right? So you have some regions of very high density contrast, uh, and then of correspondingly regions of low contrast. And so you can keep doing this experiment where I increase the Mach number, 
and I see how the corresponding distribution changes. And you can see that each time maybe you pa push a little more density past this critical density. Uh, and you ultimately just widen the distribution. So there's been a lot of studies, um, numerical studies on this, I would say, where people relate the properties of turbulence to the distribution. Um, and it ends up being uh, a function of the Mach number and also a little bit of how you drive the density fluctuation. So that's this parameter B here. But in the context of this model now, we have everything we need, right? If we just say, oh, well, these, these clouds that, the, the, that are forming stars, they're turbulent. Turbulence sets a log normal density distribution. I can write down now an analytic theory that relates the strength of the turbulence via something like the Mach number to the width of my log normal. And as long as I come up with some physically motivated uh, description of the critical density based on all these pressure terms, um, I can do this integral very easily and come up with an analytic expression for the star formation efficiency or star formation rate, which depends on this critical density and also on the Mach number or the width. OK. So we're done here, right? And again, this critical density, well, you know, that's the, the final choice. Different groups come up with different things, um, but they all basically have roughly the same dependence on things like the virial parameter and Mach number and so on. Well, OK, so this is a pretty simple picture. We can write down now its predictions. How, and then, of course, as good theorists, we want to test them, right? As, as good physicists, we want to test our predictions. So how do these, these models stand up to, or what, what, first, what do they predict? So here I'm showing you a parameter space plot of this uh, log normal model of, of turbulent regulated star formation, where this colored axis here is essentially the star formation efficiency. Um, and then the other parts of the plot are the Mach number here going from 1 to 100 and the virial parameter. Um, so low virial parameter is where gravity is more dominant. Uh, higher virial parameter, turbulence is more dominant. So OK, what does this model predict? Well, certainly it strongly predicts that you should have higher star formation rate or star formation efficiency with increasing amounts of turbulence. Right? And that's because of this Mach number dependence here. Right? So as you go to higher and higher Mach numbers, you're climbing towards higher and higher star formation rates. Right? And again, that's because you're pushing more density past this critical density. That's the main effect. Um, the other big prediction here of these models is that you should have constant star formation rates and efficiencies for constant turbulent parameters. So if your turbulence stays roughly constant with time, well, this log normal should stay constant with time. Uh, and yeah, you should have constant star formation properties. That's a prediction. Um, the other sort of kind of funny thing is that if you go into the literature, how people handle that critical density, and I've listed a few studies up here, can get a little messy, especially from the point of view of uh, uh, observers. Then they're kind of like, ah, like how do we measure all these parameters? Um, that, that's a bit. Um, sort of unsatisfying. But roughly, you can see all of them have this Mach number and alpha virial parameter dependence. So then we can ask ourselves, well, are these basic predictions matched with the observations? Or do simulations show these predictions? Um, and then we can go look. Well, I would say the most fundamental prediction is actually not matched with observations, and that's the dependence on Mach number. So here I'm showing the star formation rate. So this is in solar masses per year of local star forming clouds in our Milky Way galaxy. Um, how the star formation rate is measured here is actually, I would say, the most uh, fun, I don't know, I don't want to say fundamental, but it's like the most uh, resolved way possible. And in this case, it's counting young stellar objects in a cloud. Um, and associating a time scale with them, right? So you're just literally going into the cloud and counting the young stars. So you're not even using a tracer for them, right? Because these are local clouds, we can do that. Um, so this, just suffice to say, this is a pretty good estimate of star formation rate. And then this Mach number here, this is a turbulent Mach number measured from carbon monoxide as a tracer for the turbulent velocity dispersion. 
and then also as a tracer for the temperature to get the sound speed. So again, this is about as resolved a view as we can get in terms of these two parameters. And you know, I challenge you to find really a correlation between the star formation rate and the Mach number. Uh, certainly, it's not in the way that um, the, the model would predict. So this is one sort of challenge for these models. Another challenge um, that I've been raising recently is actually when you go through these models, these turbulent regulated star formation models, which there's been you know, hundreds of papers written on them over the last like 15 years or so, and they claim to predict things like the star formation efficiency. Well, when you go and you see this expression, so this is not to pick on one of them, but poor Paulo, I'm picking on his paper here. You go here and you see, well, there's this, this uh, epsilon term here. This is actually because there's no way that these models can predict the star formation efficiency. You have to put it in by hand. And so going from this picture of turbulent regulated star formation, where you have just this simple density distribution given by turbulence, to explaining this 1% correlation that we see in local star forming regions and, and galaxies is, is not really possible with these models. So what can we do? How, what can we add to turbulence here? Um, this is just to say that these, there's some tension here with these models. Well, we can go back to our cartoon, right? So the, the physical problem that we set up here of this turbulent regular star formation, let's go back to the drawing board a bit and look at what we missed, perhaps. Well, we really only got to here, this line, right? And we didn't actually include anything about gravitational collapse or feedback, right? We only got to this density fluctuation in this picture. And so the bottom line here, and this is really just the takeaway point now, is that you have to include the effects of gravity and stellar feedback if you want to model the efficiency of star formation. Um, and in particular, both of those effects also alter the density PDF. And if you don't include them, then you can't predict the star formation efficiency. And it almost seems like a no-brainer that you should include gravity for star formation, right? Um, but those, those analytic models uh, up until this point hadn't included them. So what did we do? Well, first of all, the cool thing here that nature is just telling us, actually, is that this idea that the density PDF for star forming regions is log normal is not correct. Okay, so I've actually been uh, pulling your leg a bit the whole time. But this really wasn't realized until somewhat recently. Um, so we really uh, recently only got enough resolution in terms of dust observation mapping in local Milky Way clouds. So for example, with the Herschel Observatory, to really see the full density distribution. You really need a lot of dynamic range in terms of density or column density in order to see this. And you see, actually, what these star-forming clouds look like is a log normal and a power law. You don't just have a pure log normal. You have the log normal at low densities. And then the observations are telling us, well, actually, once you get to high enough density or high enough column density, right, projected density along the line of sight, you start seeing, actually, the distribution looks more like a power law. Um, and there's some correlation here. These are really nice observations with Herschel from Schneider et al showing that actually there's, there seems to be a correlation with how actively star forming a particular cloud is. So for example, this is Orion B. It's a very active star forming cloud. It has a lot of high mass star formation. You have this really strong power law. Whereas if you look at this cloud Polaris, it's not so actively star forming. You have just mostly this log normal. Um, yeah, there were many papers published in the last several years, both both observational and now numerical. Um, from the numerical community, I would say the simulations with just turbulence and then people including gravity, actually you didn't see this power law distribution forming until you started including something called adaptive mesh refinement, where you could start to refine collapsing regions with high enough resolution. Um, so suffice to say that this is kind of the current picture of the density distribution in star forming clouds. Uh, this is uh, a plot from a Harvard grad student, Hope Chen, uh, showing, well, in the low density or diffuse gas, so things like atomic uh, gas um, you f or, or some diffuse molecular gas, you form this log normal, which is basically represented 
this turbulent supported gas. But once you get to high enough density, you start to gravitationally collapse, and gravity pulls the distribution into a power law, right? A, a collapsing, a collapsing sort of self-similar uh, hierarchical collapse, which gives you this power law. And this is a list of, of many papers. You can see basically the earliest here is 2009, right? So this paper by Kanyulainen. This was an observational paper uh, that talked about this power law. And so these previous theory papers that only focus on the log normal were missing this key piece, I think. Um, with simulations, we can study how this power law evolves with time, right? So this was the starting movie. You've already been here. Uh, T of zero here is where we just initialize turbulence. That's only supersonic turbulence. And then we switch on gravity. Uh, and then you start to see these turbulent structures collapsing. Well, we can then follow the evolution of the, the, dens the density distribution. And this is the slope of the power law tail as a function of time. Right? So this is time in, in units of this free fall time. Uh, these are different simulations, different magnetic fields. It doesn't really matter. What you see is that as you collapse over time, you develop a flatter and flatter power law slope. Right, because you're collecting more mass in these high density collapsing regions. Um, and you know, from the observational point of view, there's also been a lot of work done to try to understand how this power loss slope is, is related to the properties of star formation. This is a, a study I really like by Stutz and Kanyulainen, where they took individual regions in Orion, and here you can just literally see the 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 forming stars, these are young stellar objects here, and they chopped up this filament which was forming stars and studied in each of those boxes its PDF. Here's the PDFs, you see these power laws forming, and the regions which have the most star formation, the highest star formation rates and highest star formation efficiencies also have this flat, super flat power law uh, tail, so this black box here with all these stars. So there's definitely a correlation between how flat this slope is and the, and the um, properties of star formation. And in the final um, part of the talk, I'll talk about an update for this, which basically, in again, a very simple picture, we say, well, okay, we, we now know that turbulence sets this log normal, and we have gravity, which pulls things into a power law. So now we can update these star formation models to include both a log normal and a power law. So we can do this as a piecewise function. And if we assume that this uh, distribution is continuous and differentiable, so we don't have any kinks in our, in our function uh, and, it's, and, and it's continuous, then you can easily solve for uh, the amplitude uh, at which these two functions uh, join, as well as uh, the, the density at which they join. Um, and yeah, so this, this has no physics whatsoever, right? So this is just a log normal plus power law. It's a piecewise function. And you can solve, uh, in particular, the most interesting thing here for, the, for the, the problem of star formation is the transition density between the diffuse, turbulent log normal and the gravitationally traced power law. And uh, mathematically, that just depends on the width of your log normal, which is this sigma uh, of s and then the slope of the power law tail, which I'm calling here alpha. OK, so then how does it update this picture we have? Right? So now we have this piecewise function. Well, we can still say we, we understand how that width is controlled. Right? It's, it's governed by how strong the density fluctuations set by supersonic turbulence is. And now, once we're past this critical density, we know that gravity starts to collapse things. Right? So the highest density things collapse fastest, that's governed by their free fall time. Um, and so we start forming this power law out to high densities first. And because it's an analytic model, we can also play with it. So we can change the slope. Uh, and that gives us a, for a particular width set by the turbulence, that gives us a unique transition density. Um, and, and you see that as you go to shallower or flatter slopes, the transition density climbs up. Right? And so you can see that it easily should reach, and you intu intuitively, I think you expect this, that at some point you should roughly match whatever that critical density for collapses in the first place. Um, okay, 
So how does that compare to those log normal only models? Again, what are the predictions of this model compared to the predictions of the other model? So of course that's something we can test. Well, the most, I think, uh, strikingly obvious thing is now that we're building this power law tail, right, and we're building up the amount of material past the critical density, we should have an acceleration of star formation. Star formation should no longer be thought of in an analytic model sense as a static thing. It should now be time varying, right? We should have variable star formation rates and efficiencies. And indeed, if you compare the star formation rate uh, predicted by these models, uh, the flat lines here are the log normal only prediction, right? Because uh, the x-axis here I'm showing the, the slope of that power law, right? So those models don't depend on any sort of power law, so they're just flat in this parameter space. But you can see that you get a rise in the star formation rate uh, from this piecewise approach uh, with the star formation rate, uh, with, with the power law slope. So this just means that the model is naturally time varying. Okay, that's one prediction. Um, the other is that it kind of allows a simpler viewpoint. So the expression, right, doesn't look simpler. It looks like terrible because it's a piecewise function and it's longer than the other one. But actually you can say, well, hold on, because that transition density starts to creep up to the critical density, whatever that critical density is, right, it's just, it just represents the point at which the density starts collapsing. Um, now you can say, well, Actually, nature gives us a natural way of tracing star-forming gas compared to non-star-forming gas, right? If we can observe it, and we can do this in local clouds, we can do this in our simulations, we can say, well, I have a log normal. That's mostly my supported gas that's not participating in collapse. I have a power law. Certainly, gravity is, is, is doing the work there. Um, so I just naturally can write down an efficiency, especially an integrated efficiency, if I just compare the amount of material in the power law part as compared to the total, right? Um, so this you can write down as a sort of a self-gravitating gas fraction. I've called it F dense here. Um, it's, it's quite easy to calculate. And so that naturally allows us to reduce a lot of parameters in terms, especially in terms of various fudge factors for the critical density and so on that, were, that are features of a lot of these other models. Um, and so then we can start to test this on simulations and observations um, because, again, this model, it, it only depends on the width of the PDF, which depends on the Mach number, and then the slope of this, this power law, right? Both of those things are, are measurable observationally. Uh, and, of course, also from our simulations. So we were doing some tests with simulations. Um, so these only have gravity. And this is, again, based on the movies I was showing you earlier where you just have turbulence and then you start to form these power laws as you uh, begin to allow gravity to collapse things. So the points here, these individual points are the simulations, uh, predictions based on the Mach number, which is shown here on the x-axis. Uh, and this is the comparison of the ratio of the, the amount of material in the power law to the total. That's what the points are. Um, and then the lines here are the analytic model. And so you see they match pretty well, as, as you might expect. So that's good news. But the bad news here is that if you take this dense gas fraction to be roughly the, um, the star formation efficiency, well, as I told you, the observations suggest around 1%. And there is some fluctuation, maybe up to 10% or so. Um, but you can see here that, well, this model would predict very high star formation efficiencies. Um, and so again, what are we missing? Well, if you go back to that cartoon picture, the final point is feedback, stellar feedback. Um, and so that's the final piece of this model. And again, we can test this with simulations. Here's a very recent simulation study um, uh, by the FIRE collaboration uh, and, and Mike Grudick uh, down the road here at, at Caltech uh, doing simulations of turbulence, gravity, uh, and, and finally of, of feedback and following how feedback evolves in these simulations and in particular studying how feedback affects the efficiency of star formation. And so you see the predictions of this model that I was just talking about here, whereas if you only have turbulence and gravity, that's the black line here. So you naturally you get an acceleration of star formation rate and efficiency, right? And that's exactly what these simulations show. It just climbs and climbs and climbs up until 100% where you turned all your gas into stars, 
But if you include feedback, and again, what I mean by feedback can be many processes. In these simulations, it's once you form stars, you have jets, and you also have radiation that drives out the gas away from the collapsing region. Um, you see that you, peak, you accelerate, you peak, and then the stellar feedback starts to drop things off here. Okay? And lo and behold, you get around 1% right, on average if you, if you follow all of these individual physical processes together, the turbulence, um, the feedback, uh, and the gravity. Um, so these, again, are just different simulations um, that we're studying now to, to capture this effect of feedback in the analytic model. Um, these are simulations uh, done with a code called FLASH by Christoph Federath, um, who's collaborating with us on this. So this box here is just gravity and turbulence. And then the difference here, and I'll restart the simulation so you can tell, they're really identical initial conditions. And then this box here has feedback from stars, in particular jet feedback. So at some point you start forming stars here. I don't know if you can see it, but there's a, there's a, a star particle. It will start interacting back on the star forming cloud here uh, in terms of its, its, its stellar feedback, whereas on your left here, there is no feedback. And by the end of the simulation, what ends up happening is that the simulation that includes feedback has a much lower star forming efficiency. Um, and, and this one actually stops earlier because it reaches uh, upwards of 20% very early. But here you see that uh, the, the party is still going in terms of the star formation. Uh, uh, the efficiency is much lower at the end of the day with this simulation. OK, so we can use these kind of simulations that include feedback to study how it would uh, interact with this analytic model. So that's what I have a student working on right now at Rutgers, Sabrina Apple. She's taking the output of these uh, MHD simulations with gravity and turbulence in magnetic fields, and then also the similar simulation, but just now adding feedback and studying how this analytic model works um, in terms of when you add feedback. So, of course, in this simulation, there's no feedback, it's just turbulence and gravity. So you have this log normal power law form. Uh, in this case here, because of the feedback, you start to pump up at later times. It's hard to see here. The green line here is the later time, right? So once feedback has been going, you start to increase the amount of material you have in the diffuse region, which would, of course, in the context of this analytic model, lower your star formation efficiency um, because you're, you're increasing the amount in this diffuse part. So this is work in progress, but I think very promising. Um, and with that, I'd like to conclude. Um, I will leave up these conclusion points here. Uh, and this is in particular just really about the, the, the latter part of the talk in terms of the star formation efficiency. The main takeaway point here is that you don't just have a static model picture anymore. We really have to include the effect of gravity to accelerate the star formation efficiency, and then ultimately feedback to then lower it down again. And if we have uh, a realistic density distribution where uh, turbulence sets the log normal, gravity sets the power law, and then eventually feedback then starts to pump back up this diffuse gas part, I think we can have a very elegant and simple picture to describe the star formation. Um, and again, I'll just point you to, to this website here for a lot of the statistics um, and simulations that I mentioned in the talk. Thank you for your attention. Yeah, so, so I think from our early, st our initial studies is something we're actively looking at now, how it affects this density distribution. Right now we're looking at jet feedback, um, which is just you form a star particle and then you have some prescription for how the star particle then ejects mass, um, usually in some sort of isotropic way. Um, and then the other feedback mechanism we're looking at is radiative feedback where the star particle then heats the gas around it. Um, you could also look at supernova feedback. Um, we think that probably is a longer time scale, um, but that's something that we also want to study. 
So the two main mechanisms that seem to be important for setting the efficiency, just based on the simulation work like I showed Mike Grudick's um, simulations, is the jet feedback and the radiative feedback. Uh, but so far no one's looked at how the density distribution depends on those things um, or how that would interplay with this analytic model. So that's what we're doing now. Right. That's right. Yeah. So, so how how the IMF gets set, I think, is still very much an unsolved issue. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, there's, I would say, a couple different ways. Um, one is with a resolution study, right? So we run different, uh, these turbulent box simulations. Um, resolution is really important. So how big the box is basically dictates how much dynamic range you have to develop this turbulent cascade. Uh, it also basically sets the Reynolds number. Right, so how large the Reynolds number can get is a function of your box size, your velocity, and then how much you know, viscosity that you have in the system. So larger box, you get higher Reynolds number. Um, that ends up being a really important quality control issue in the simulation because if the box is too small, you don't develop this cascade, you don't develop this inertial range, right? you don't have this power law. Right? So if you have a so a, a kind of a, nowadays, uh, a small box would be 256 cubed or 512 cubed, which are still, you know, reasonably expensive simulations. You still need a supercomputer uh, to run those sort of simulations. Um, there you barely get any sort of inertial range, right? So you, you might, if you took a power spectrum of those simulations, you would actually mostly see, you'd see this, like, peak where you'd have the inertial range. And then it would almost be like an exponential fall off right into a dissipation. So if you go to a bigger box, you start to be able to hopefully resolve some of that inertial range. Um, so a resolution study would be one way to quality control uh, your simulations. Um, and then, of course, you have, um, so if you run um, a simulation which is like a isotropic, hydrodynamic, cast turbulent box, you have analytic predictions for that. So, for example, does it match the Kolmogorov scaling? Um, if it's a MHD um, incompressible box, does it match a particular analytic model uh, of how, how the MHD cascade proceeds? So those are some, some ways that you can do quality checks. Um, yeah, well, it, I guess it depends on, I mean, if you're still in a galaxy, like the critical density would be whatever it is, right? So, I mean, most of, at least for, for local star formation in, in galaxies that we, you know, see in the, you know, local volume, uh, the star formation efficiency seems fairly universal, which might be evidence that the critical density is roughly similar in different regions. Um, there are extreme regions. So I think actually one where you can, place you can test how this critical density argument for star formation is actually places like the galactic center. Um, so the galactic center is this very interesting place where you have a lot of high density gas, um, which should be ripe for star formation, right? You have high dense gas fractions, which should be uh, excellent tracers of booming star formation, mm -hmm. but meanwhile you have very low efficiencies of star formation in the galactic center, and one possible explanation for that is that it's a very turbulent environment. The Mach numbers can be up to 50, the virial parameters are, are large, and so that pushes your critical density to a much higher uh, threshold for, for the gas to overcome. Um, and so the dynamics of the galaxy can then come into play in terms of setting those things. Um, and so that could be another reason why 
things like bars or bulges could potentially quench star formation is because they're affecting that virial parameter. Yeah, so this, this model would allow for scatter. Um, the scatter, the prediction here is that the scatter should basically be dependent on how much dense gas there is, right? So if you have this, I don't know which one's better to point here, this picture here. So the scatter would be, well, I have some particular snapshot of this galaxy, and it just so happens that there's not a lot of dense self-gravitating gas, right? So it has this steeper power loss slope if, if you were able to resolve its density PDF. Um, the other uh, thing that could be contributing is to a scatter is different sorts of dynamical processes, which are increasing or decreasing your virial parameter, which would then in turn set your critical density. Um, so if you could measure things like dense gas fractions or velocity dispersions, um, that would, you know, you don't actually have to measure this PDF, right? You can't right, in a resolved way in terms of a, uh, another galaxy. But you can measure uh, velocity dispersions. You can measure dense gas fractions, potentially. So those, those would be sort of the key predictive um, elements that you would want to compare this with for a system like that. Uh, yeah, that's a great question. So if you recall this cartoon of this eddies, like if you think of this turbulent picture in terms of eddies, you have large scale eddies, right? If you've ever been like canoeing, let's say, if you push the paddle in the water, it starts with these two big, lar you know, these two large eddies. And then if you keep watching, it breaks into smaller eddies, right? Or if you see like a, a smokestack or some smoke, you start off with these large eddies and then they quickly form into smaller and smaller eddies until you can't see it anymore. So this, this is a self-similar structures that you form in a turbulent cascade, and they're hierarchical, right? So you have these large-scale structures, which break into smaller-scale structures, which break into... So this, this naturally forms a power law. In, in terms of the, the kinetic energy spectrum, uh, it, it forms, or uh, the distribution of sizes, um, those sort of processes that are self-similar form power laws. 